of the School on Particle Physics, uh, joint uh, ICTP Cypher, ICTP Trieste. So today, once again, we start uh, with lectures on dark matter physics uh, by Professor Francesco Deramo. So, Francesco, please, stage is yours. Thank you, Enrico. Thank you very much, and good morning to everyone. And let me start by sharing my screen. So, Enrico, can you please tell me if you can uh, see I can. my slides? Yes, very okay. good. Okay, so welcome everybody again, and welcome to the second lecture. Yesterday, we got convinced that uh, dark matter exists, and uh, also we went through a list of basic requirements that pretty much every dark matter model, model must uh, satisfy in order to be vi viable. So today we will start to see some explicit example. So yesterday, I remember I got one question, and by the way, please ask as many questions as you want. I was really happy I got so many yesterday. It's uh, good to, to know that uh, you are following me and uh, you are uh, asking questions because I, I, I cannot see your faces the way in, inside the classroom. So um, somebody asked me, if it's not baryonic, what it could be? And uh, today we will see some possible answers, okay? So uh, in particular, we will focus today on uh, dark matter genesis. In other words, we will focus on dark matter production mechanisms. So mechanisms that are effective in the early universe. So you had a very uh, beautiful set of lectures on cosmology during the first week of this school. So, you know, you have learned a lot about the early universe. And the early universe will, will be the stage where dark matter particles uh, are produced at very early times. So you already know uh, uh, the, the, the canvas where we will paint uh, these uh, scenarios. So I will uh, make a few remarks uh, about uh, the early universe and will remind you some key equations both to uh, remind you what uh, uh, some quantities are, also to introduce my notation. I think it's uh, good to avoid confusion. So here there is a, a picture that I even showed yesterday from the particle data group. And this is the, the, the understanding we have about the history of the universe, the conventional picture that we have. So we have, uh, uh, we believe that everything started with the Big Bang, then we had a phase where the universe was very hot and dense. It was dominated by a radiation bath. And then uh, we had nucleosynthesis where heavy nuclei forms. Then we had recombination when the universe became uh, neutral. And then we had galaxy formations until we end up to the present time. So the question I want to address during this lecture, so this lecture will be entirely devoted to uh, dark matter production mechanisms. And in particular, I want to address the question about what mechanism, mechanism could be responsible for dark matter production in the early universe. Tomorrow, we will revisit some of the results that I shared today by using a tool known as the Boltzmann equation where we can do things in a more quantitative way. For this lecture, we will just uh, see the basic ideas, okay? So I hope to deliver the concepts that will be necessary tomorrow to be more quantitative with the Boltzmann equation. <clears throat> okay, so an important caveat that uh, it's, uh, oftentimes it was, it's not even stated because everybody knows that, but it's worth keeping this in mind, is that we, the earliest moment that we can probe in the history of the universe is a Big Bang nucleosynthesis, the time of Big Bang nucleosynthesis. Uh, at this epoch, the universe had a temperature of more or less one MeV and uh, an age of one second. And uh, it is uh, fair and honest to say that we don't know what the universe looked like at uh, temperatures or times uh, above BBN, okay? So if our dark matter production mechanism is uh, active, which means it's mostly efficient at uh, phases in the expansion history before BBN, then it's honest to say that every calculation we do for the relic density is based on an assumption. The assumption that the history of the universe is extrapolated even at times earlier than BBN in a way that I will describe in a couple of slides. 
And uh, we also know, as we discussed yesterday, that dark matter must be around at the time of CMB formation. We observe CMB and we already have evidence that there is uh, some non-baryonic matter. Actually, most of matter is non-baryonic, as we saw yesterday. So whatever mechanism we consider must have done its job at the time of CMB formation. So in this lecture, I will discuss uh, production mechanisms that uh, are active before we begin, and uh, I will assume a standard expansion history. By standard expansion history, I mean that I take a snapshot of the universe at BBN, when the universe was one second old, and I extrapolate it back by using the known laws of physics and by using um, my knowledge, our knowledge of the standard model. So let me be more quantitative about this uh, assumption, which is an assumption, and uh, let me uh, state what I mean. So the energy density of the universe when the dark matter production took place was dominated by a gas of relativistic particles. So this is the primordial bath, okay? You see that there are the known standard model particles, the up, the down, the quarks, the X doublet, the gauge bosons, such as the gluon, the, the electroweak gauge bosons, the electrons, all particles that you learned about uh, last week during the lectures of Professor Romanino. Of course, uh, um, there could be something more because there are motivated extensions of the standard model, such as uh, supersymmetry or any other, that predicts the presence of additional degrees of freedom that have uh, enough interaction with the standard model to thermalize with the uh, standard model particles. So the primordial bath is composed of standard model particles plus something else, possibly, depending on the theory you consider, and you have to do calculations self-consistently. And all of these particles share the same temperature, T. So from now on, we will see a lot of times T, T, C. So T is the temperature of the primordial bath. So this is, I go, I'll go fast here because I'm sure this is something you have seen uh, last week, but I want to give you the equation. So if you want to reproduce some of the calculations that I do, I do in these lectures, you have all the basic ingredients. So here I put for you, the number density, which are just arising from the integration of the phase space of a statistical distribution function at the equilibrium, both in the relativistic regime and in the relativistic regime. And uh, in the relativistic regime, there is a difference between bosons and fermions by known statistical factors. Same exercise for the energy densities. It's uh, again uh, an integral over phase space. You see here there is E square, here you have E cubed. You multiply by an extra power of E because you want to find the energy density, not just the number density. And again, you can find uh, limiting expressions in uh, relativistic limit and non-relativistic limit. In the non-relativistic limit, uh, uh, the mass density, sorry, the energy density is uh, entirely accounted for by the rest mass energy. So when I say MI and I, I use the color red because we have to go back and use this expression, the red expression for the number density. Okay. okay, so there is a nice way to summarize the energy content of the universe when it's dominated by radiation bath. The energy density is given by this expression here, where pi square over 30 are just known factors. T to the fourth is there, and uh, you can guess this must be the case even by dimensional analysis because the, the temperature is the only scale that uh, you have in a gas dominated by relativistic particles. Masses are negligible. And so by dimensional analysis, by using the natural units, the energy density must scale as an energy to the fourth. And then there is this G star factor, which is accounting, which it's actually counting more than accounting, it's counting the relativistic degrees of freedom in the plasma. So you sum over bosons and over fermions, and you sum only over the ones with a mass less than the temperature, because you want to account for the energy density carried by relativistic degrees of freedom. And there is a statistical factor, 7 over 8, which is the same 7 over 8 that you find here for fermions. So this is a rough approximation. This G star function is not really a step function, but the trans here, each degree of freedom is counted as 1 if it's relativistic and 0 if non-relativistic. 
but actually there is a, a smoother transition between the different regimes. This is a plot I made where there is this uh, phase here where a QCD phase transition happens. So I just drew a straight line because the, this is something you cannot compute in a weekly couple regime. There are, there are results, but I, I, I don't want to, to focus on them now. I just want to show you that the function is actually a smooth function. It's not a step function. And uh, at very high temperature, if you account for all the standard model degrees of freedom, there is a famous number, which is 106.75. And this is the number or relativistic degrees of freedom if you account for the entire standard model. Okay, so another useful thing, and this is a review from last week, but also some uh, way for me to introduce my notation. So for me, the scale factor is A, T is the time, the time of the friedman roberts walker metric. H is the Hubble parameter. So for a radiation dominated universe, the Hubble parameter as a function of time is one over QT. And uh, the Hubble parameter by using the Friedman equation during the radiation domination phase is given by this expression here, where you have uh, the temperature square divided by M Planck. And uh, you may find the Friedman equation written the way I do, or you may find it written with the Newton constant Gn. Okay, so I'm using the Planck mass, which is defined as, this is called the reduced Planck mass because there is this extra eight pi factor. And so for me, the Planck mass is given by this expression. The numerical value is more or less 10 to the 18 GV. So from this equation here, if you neglect the G star dependence, which you can see from this plot, in the standard model, in the temperature range that we care about, it ranges from 10 to 100. So it changes by a factor of 10 at most. And here you see that T and time, temperature and time can range over a much, much wider interval. And so if you forget about this G star dependence, you have a very useful relation, which is approximate, but it tells you that one second corresponds to one MeV and uh, the scaling can also be seen by I, T times time, sorry, time times temperature square must be constant. And the overall scale is set by the numbers from BBN that I mentioned already. The universe at BBN was one second old and the temperature was one MeV. So entropy density, uh, you can also define the same way you define the uh, number density and the energy density, you can define the entropy density. Again, by doing an integral over the statistical distribution, there is an analogous factor G star S. Uh, and uh, for these lectures, G star and G star S are pretty much equal. So you can be more sophisticated, but for this set of lectures, we can safely assume that they are the same. I put here the different symbol just to be complete, but uh, in all the calculation, we can assume they are the same. And uh, this is a crucial point. Within our working assumption, the entropy in a commoving volume is conserved. So a commoving volume is a volume of space in the universe that does not change once you account for the expansion. So a commoving volume gets bigger with time. It's the same region of space just being stretched by the expansion. And the amount of entropy within that volume is conserved because we are assuming that the energy density is dominated by this radiation bath. So the, the expansion is adiabatic. And so you see that the entropy in the moving volume is given by this uh, S times uh, A cube, scale factor cube. So the scale factor cube accounts for the size of the moving volume. And of course it grows with time. So entropy conservation can be expressed by this relation here. And once we impose that uh, the, um, um, uh, the, the entropy is conserved, we find this very useful relation that tells us how the temperature and the scale factor are related. And again, this is even to one third. So the G star correction is really small here. And uh, if you neglect this G star factor, you find that the temperature of the plasma decreases linearly with the inverse scale factor. So T times A is constant. The last thing I want to say, and then maybe I can stop for questions, but this is uh, the last slide to conclude the first part of my lecture, my review part on uh, 
the cosmological background of radiation. Uh, this is something that I also mentioned yesterday, and uh, somebody asked me a clarification about the definition, so I prepare, uh, I, I hope, a clear slide. First of all, let, define, let me define what I mean by the commoving density. The commoving number density is defined as the number density divided by the entropy density. And uh, the reason why this is a useful variable is that if you do not have uh, um, processes that change the number of particles, as for example, dark matter annihilations, where you have two dark matter particles in initial state and zero in the final state, the, the number density of dark matter particle will change because the universe is getting bigger, okay? But it changes in a way that n times a cube is constant. And uh, for this reason, you have that in the absence of number changing processes, ni over s is the same as ni a cube divided by s a cube. I have done nothing here. I just multiplied above and below by a cube. So the numerator is constant. The denominator is constant. So the ratio must be constant. So this variable is very useful as we will see today, and in particular tomorrow when we solve the Boltzmann equation, this is very useful because it's a variable that scales out the effect of the, of the Hubble expansion. So if you have a dark matter production mechanism that is uh, setting a value for the dark matter density, after this uh, mechanism stops being effective, the variable Y does not change with time. N will change, but Y will not. And then I also gave you here uh, the, this is something you can check because in the previous slides I gave you all the equations to, to check this uh, two limiting expression for relativistic and for non-relativistic uh, particles. Okay, so Enrico, I ask you if there are questions because this is a good point to... Yes, Francesco. So we have a few questions. Let me read okay. them to you. Uh, so... Uh... Moinul is asking, which standard model particles are massive at this stage? Uh, at this stage, meaning uh, in the early universe, I think radiation domination. So the phase I have in mind for the dark matter particle production is roughly speaking be between 10, 100 TV and 1 MeV. This is the mass range I want to consider. So the number of degrees of freedom from the standard model that are relativistic depends on what temperature I'm considering in this interval. If, uh, so the, the, I think the best answer is this plot. So if you are, you see here I go from one MeV to one uh, TeV, okay? And then above the TeV stays constant. So if you are above 100 GeV, this is all the standard models, so all of them. If you go down, you see that the top, the Higgs boson, the W, the Z, becomes no relativistic and so G star decreases. Uh, I will uh, show you calculations in the next part of this lecture where this G star will appear explicitly and it will be a G star evaluated at the given moment, which is the moment of result that I will explain what it means. So. The answer is it depends. It depends on the parameter space you're considering. Very good. So we have uh, a question from Lorena. So Lorena still does not understand why dark matter was formed and what caused uh, its formation. Okay, so the dark matter formation is something that I did not discuss yet. So, so far I've been describing only the primordial bath. Okay, so, so far you see there is no dark matter in this, in this slide. Uh, I'm just trying to, you see, setting the stage. This is the title of the slide. I'm trying to set the stage where dark matter production uh, happens. So uh, maybe it's uh, better that we just wait and then hopefully at, this, at the end of this lecture, there will be explicit examples of uh, how dark matter forms. This is okay. actually my next topic. Very good. So Lorena, if you have... Uh... Okay, I think this also answered the next question by Ganesh. So if this is not the case, Ganesh, please reiterate. And, ah, and we have another question, always by Lorena. So she's asking, do black holes have something to do with dark matter creation? So uh, primordial black holes could be dark matter candidates. So the answer is yes. Uh, 
but uh, uh, this is uh, something that I will not discuss today and probably there will need be no time to discuss this uh, uh, in, uh, in, the, in these lectures. But maybe this is something we can discuss over the Q&A session. Here I'm reviewing the standard production mechanism, but the answer to the question is yes, uh, they could be dark matter particles, so the, the, the dark matter creation is the creation of a black hole. But uh, these are black holes very different from the one that we talk about in astrophysics that arises from a collapse of uh, stars. These are black holes uh, created in the early universe. And so they are called primordial black holes because at the time of uh, uh, Big Bang nucleosynthesis and also at the time of uh, CMB, they must already behave as non-baryonic matter. And uh, we know that there were no stars at the time. So we have, uh, okay, let me ask you one question from Sudipta, then, uh, ah, no, no, sorry. We have two more questions. Uh, is it okay mm -hmm. if I ask them now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we can uh, move on. Okay. Yes. Okay, so Sudipta is asking, is entropy conservation valid for all the time of the universe evolution? So the answer is no. Uh, and uh, in particular, in the phase where we go from inflation to the radiation bath, there is a process known as reheating, which in my opinion, it's not a very good name. It should be called heating because it's not something that, it's like recombination. It should be called combination. Anyway, so reheating is uh, when the radiation bath is created from the decay of uh, the inflaton. And in this case, entropy conservation does not hold and these decays produce lots of entropy. So this is one case that we believe it must have happened. But of course, there are motivated a modification of the cosmology above BBN, where you can also modify the conservation of entropy. And so at this level, I would say it is an assumption. If we assume that at the temperature of interest, there is all the radiation bath, then entropy is conserved. But this is an assumption. Very good. So we have one last question from Jenny. So the, the question is, what is the meaning of Y equilibrium? Co-moving density in what time? So where did I put Y? Oh, here. Yes. This one. What time? So uh, it's actually at what temperature? So you see it's function of the temperature. There is G star of S here. There is T appearing here. And the temperature and time are related by the Friedman equation. So I'm giving you the expression as a function of the temperature. If you want it as a function of time, you can just use this equation to convert. Okay, very good. So I will keep, there is one more, there are a couple more questions, but I think it's, uh, it's better if we move on uh, and I'll ask them later on. Okay, okay, very good. So now I will, in the following, I will attempt a general classification for the dark matter production mechanism. And we will see two explicit examples today of dark matter production mechanisms, and we will do calculations. We will compute dark matter densities. So I've seen many people trying to attempt a general classification. And uh, if you try to be general, I believe there are always caveats and exceptions. So my classification is general for the following reason. You will see in a second that it will work. So I call thermal dark matter production, the dark matter produced in the following way. Three conditions must be satisfied. The dark matter production happened when energy budget of the universe was dominated by radiation bath. This is the assumption we've been making so far. Then there is another important requirement that the dark matter particle at some point, at some point was also part of the primordial bath. So this is possible if dark matter has enough interaction with the standard model particles. Otherwise, thermal equilibrium will, be, will not be possible to achieve. And uh, finally, another request that is uh, very important is that, of course, at some point, dark matter particles decoupled from the plasma and the thermal equilibrium was lost. And the process of departure from thermal equilibrium is what set the dark matter abundance back in the past, okay? So these three conditions must be satisfied. And my classification works because they call non-thermal anything else. So there are no exceptions, okay? So dark matter 
thermally produced must satisfy these three requirements. And uh, in these lectures and also in the next one, we will focus on these cases here uh, because there are motivated candidates that are produced in this way and because there are several experiments that have as a target candidates produced in, the, in this way. So I will focus on these uh, kind of uh, uh, particles a lot in the, this lecture and the next ones as well. And then at the end of this uh, lecture series in the last one, we will discuss one example of a non-thermal candidate, which is the axion. So here I put, uh, these are just random examples. I don't mean to be exhaustive, but standard model neutrinos are thermal relics. We will see in a second that they are thermal relics that cannot account for dark matter, but they are thermal relics. WIMPs, WIMPs will be, will be playing a huge role in this lecture because uh, these are the most popular dark matter candidates and uh, I believe that when you have a course on introduction to dark matter, you need to know WIMPs really well. So they will be, it will be my goal for the next couple of lectures. Another are examples of non-thermal production axions. I will not say much because it's something that we will discuss in the, in the last lecture. One example of, which is interesting, I think, because it shows you the importance of this condition. Okay, the third condition, asymmetric dark matter, namely a dark matter particle uh, whose abundance arises from a primordial asymmetry between particle and antiparticle, exactly as it is the case for baryons, okay? So asymmetric dark matter, of course, could have been in thermal equilibrium in the early universe. So you easily satisfy the first condition, you easily satisfy the second one, but <clears throat> the decoupling has nothing to do with the numerical value of the density because the decoupling is uh, set by the, uh, uh, sorry, the abundance is set by the chemical potential, if you want, is set by this primordial asymmetry. So uh, there is nothing between, nothing relating the abundance with the, with the departure from thermal equilibrium. So um, as I say, these lectures and the next couple of ones, we will focus on thermal candidates. And uh, the first question I want to address is how do we thermalize, uh, or it, were, it would be more correct to say, how do they thermalize standard model particles? So they achieve standard model particles with the plasma via collisions. The collision is uh, this one here. And uh, you see that I call, except for the last lecture when I do axions, I will always call the dark matter particle chi. This is a standard name. It doesn't mean it must be a fermion. It just means that it's a particle named chi. And there are chi annihilations to standard model particles. This could be electrons, it could be W bosons, it could be Higgs bosons, anything you want. If this collision rate is uh, strong enough, then you achieve thermal equilibrium. And uh, this is of course a reasonable assumption as long as these collisions are effective and uh, they become less effective with time because the universe is expanding, is getting colder and it's getting more diluted. So the annihilation for the, the annihilation rate, the rate for this annihilation, which is the chi number density multiplied by the cross section times the relative velocity. And this bracket symbol denotes a thermal average because they are thermal distributed. So I have to take an average over all the possible incoming velocity, incoming energies and momenta of this collision. And sigma v at some point, it will become equal to h the Hubble parameter, which sets the rate of the expansion. So the decoupling is a competition between two effects, the annihilations and the expansion. And we have decoupling when the expansion wins, when the expansion takes over. And the moment of decoupling is called freeze out. And uh, the temperature where this happens, it's called TFO. I will use this notation, okay? So freeze out is when the dark matter particle decouples. And uh, since I'm talking about thermal candidates, then this temperature will set the final abundance in a way that we will see explicitly now. Okay, so for thermal candidates describing the, I mean, ideally we would like to describe uh, the number density as a function of temperature or time. They are the same for any value of the temperature. This is something we will do tomorrow when we will introduce the Boltzmann equation, we will solve the Boltzmann equation and we will actually see how NKI depends on time or on the temperature. We will have 
a solution for each value of the temperature. But actually, in the end, uh, we really care about a narrow range of temperatures because at the early time, the solution is trivial. At temperature greater than the freeze out temperature, the chi particles are in equilibrium, so the number density must be given by the equilibrium number density, which is the one that I showed you before. At late times, at temperature much uh, lower than the freeze out, then n chi just scales as a to the minus cube, or my favorite way to say that is that y chi is constant. These two statements are equivalent if the entropy is conserved, which is something that is valid for these lectures. And so at late times, also the evolution is straightforward where we don't need a differential equation to know what's going on. This is what's going on. This is what's going on, okay? So the real interesting aspect to uh, quantify here is the connection between these two regimes because this connection and in the end, the decoupling process is what sets the relic density. It's basically what sets this value of Y, which will be re remain constant until today. So let's look again at the expression for decoupling for freeze out and sigma v. And by the way, sigma v, since it's a thermal average, could depend on the, on the freeze out temp on the temperature. And in particular, here it must be evaluated at the freeze out temperature. And uh, this is equal to Hubble when you have the freeze out. So there are two possible cases. Uh, which are known as hot relics and cold relics. So hot relics are relics that they decouple when they are relativistic. Cold relics, they decouple when they are no relativistic. Okay, so in one case, the freeze out temperature is much larger than the mass. In the other case, it's, it's much smaller. So when we solve for the freeze out condition, we can replace the n chi at the freeze out, we can replace the equilibrium value because at the freeze out, chi particles are in equilibrium. And then uh, uh, we have these two limiting expressions, which are valid at high temperature and at low temperature. So we will discuss these two cases separately. And we start from the hot relics. The hot relics uh, are excluded. So we know that dark matter cannot be hot. This is something I also mentioned yesterday when I made the list of requirements. But today I will be more quantitative and I will tell you the reasons why it cannot work. And also, uh, we will see in particular why the neutrinos in the standard model cannot work. But maybe I can stop again, Enrico, here before I start a new topic, which is the one of hot relics, to see if there is any question. Oh, yes. So you, there are several questions. Let me okay. start. Okay. So the first one is from Nehal, who's uh, going back to the question of primordial black holes. And uh, he's asking, so how can primordial black holes explain the observation that we discussed yesterday, like collision of galaxy clusters? So the collision of galaxy cluster was uh, an upper bound on the dark matter self interactions, okay? So if you remember the picture, there was the gas that was trapped in the collision point, the gas from the two clusters, but then the dark matter component of the cluster just passed through each other so the answer for primordial black holes is that that bound on the cross section is uh, satisfied and the self interaction among them is uh, low enough that uh, they can pass through each other. Remember the blue part of the picture, they were just passing through each other. So basically there was very weak self interaction. Okay, so one more question from Sudipta. I was asking about entro entropy conservation. So if entropy conservation is violated, then what would it be a good variable instead of Y? Oh, excellent question. So excellent question. So this is actually something that you need to know if you want to keep track of the dark matter density evolution when the, uh, the, there is entropy non-conservation. So the variable I use when I do this calculation, I did several of them. Let me see. Yes, so instead of using Y, I use this combination here, n i a cube, okay? So you can invent a new name and call this combination some variable you like. And this is useful because even if entropy is not conserved, this combination is constant when you have that there is no number changing interaction, okay? So the, this is the variable I use. And it's widely used in the literature, this combination here. 
Very good. So we have one more question from Anupam, who's asking, um, after the QCD phase transition, the degrees of freedom decrease. Correct. Isn't that, does in that time the entropy decrease? Uh, well, I mean, uh, well, the total entropy or the entropy density? Because I mean, the entropy density, of course, decreases if G star is decreasing. But uh, actually, there is some entropy created in the phase transition, but it's, it's a small amount. So it's uh, to a first approximation, the entropy is conserved in, even during the QCD phase transition. But the, I mean, the number, the number of degrees of freedom decreases. And so G star decreases, but it's not S that is conserved, it's S times A cube. Okay, so the total entropy is conserved, not the entropy density. Very good. So one more question from Dibiendu. So Dibiendu is asking, is it not possible that dark matter particles are produced from the direct decay of the inflaton? It's possible, yes, it is possible. It is a nice possibility that has been studied even in motivated cases such as uh, supersymmetry. And uh, it is a possibility, it is a possibility, but unfortunately we will not have time to see that in this uh, set of lectures because there are really lots of possibilities when you think about dark matter production and uh, experimental tests. I decided to discuss about the most uh, motivated, if you want, as the next case we will discuss, the case of the WIMPs, and also the, the most standard ones, but you can be very creative in the early universe. So yes, the answer is yes, it is possible. So Manush is asking, what is the type of collision happening in Kai Kai going into standard model, standard model? So this is a binary scattering that uh, could be mediated, for example, from a weak interaction. So imagine that this Kai carries weak interactions and this uh, SM is, for example, electron and positrons. So you can imagine an S-channel annihilation where you exchange a Z boson so it's a weak interaction from the standard model, but it's just one example, okay? But in the end, only the cross-section enters the calculation of, of the rate. So what you need to do is, if you have your model, you take your Lagrangian, you compute the cross-section, and actually we'll give you one exercise in a bit, and then you compute sigma bit. Um, Jen is asking, when we talk about equilibrium, do we mean a balance for the development of dark matter? So equilibrium, we mean that uh, this reaction and the opposite happens with the same rate. Okay, so I don't know what uh, uh, we mean here by, what was the question, sorry again? Uh, let, me, let me read it again. Balance. So when we talk uh, about equilibrium, do we mean a balance for the development of dark matter? I would say a balance between the direct and inverse process. And uh, yes, I mean, this is equilibrium. This is not a concept that is uh, special to this case. So when you discuss about uh, uh, processes at equilibrium in statistical mechanics, even in other contexts, it's the same equilibrium that we mean here. So Jenny, if you meant something else, uh, please elaborate. Yeah, and then uh, we can uh, reiterate yes. the question. So uh, we have two more questions. Uh, do you prefer good. to ask it? Okay. Let's ask, let's answer. No, it's good. Okay. It's good. And then uh, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> so the first one is from Vinicius, uh, who's asking, uh, can dark matter thermalize with the process dark matter, dark matter going into standard model plus X uh, where X is an, an out of particle, uh, in, sorry, an out of equilibrium particle, or dark matter needs to annihilate in particles that are themselves in thermal equilibrium to thermalize? Ah, excellent question, excellent question. So uh, I think uh, that uh, if uh, dark matter thermalizes through this process, it's hard to believe, it's hard to understand why X would not thermalize because the fact that dark matter thermalizes through this process means that these reactions are efficient. And if they are efficient, so X should also thermalize. So uh, I believe that if this reaction has a rate enough to thermalize dark matter, then eventually you will also thermalize X. Okay. Uh, so Sudip, Sudipta is asking, instead of entropy, can we use photon density? because that can also take care of the effect of the expansion. Very good, yes, it's, it's, this is an excellent uh, question as well. And uh, we could use photon density, 
but uh, there is a, a G star. So the photon density is a number times T cube. The entropy density, there is, G, there is a G star factor in front. Okay. So in the end, uh, what entropy density is expressing is this equality here. And uh, if you assume that G star is constant, then photon and entropy density are equivalent. There is only an overall constant in the ratio. But the ratio between photon density and uh, uh, entropy density, in general, is a function of the temperature through this tiny dependence via G star. So if you want to be very precise, you have to use the entropy density because S A cube is constant, but N gamma A cube is not constant. There are G star corrections. So up to G star correction, you can do that. But if you want to be precise, you have to use the entropy density. Okay, so we have uh, one last question from Yuxara, then I think we can move on. Huh? Yeah, good, good, okay. Uh, so the question that. is, uh, what is the best limit for the value of the mass of M chi? Okay, so this is something we will discuss actually in a couple of slides for hot relics and for cold relics tomorrow. So I will answer soon. Soon for hot relics and for cold relics tomorrow. Very good. Okay, Francesco, I think we can move on. Very good, great, great. I'm really happy we have so many questions. So this is fun for everybody. <laughs> okay, so now, uh, what's it? Oh, we have still 45 minutes, right, Enrico? Yes. Yes. Very good. So I think I will do 15 minutes on hot relics and 30 minutes on cold relics. Great. Actually, the, the uh, hot relic calculation is uh, very simple because uh, the first thing to compute, this is true for cold and hot relics, but the first thing to compute when you have uh, hot relics uh, is uh, the freeze out temperature. And the freeze out temperature is obtained by a comparison between the annihilation rate and the Hubble rate. Okay, so I'm. This is an equation that I've wrote many times. I'm just using the relativistic expression for n chi. You can go back and you have the slides, you can go back. I gave you all the equations to, to do the derivations. So you solve and you find the freeze out temperature and you see that the freeze out temperature is a function of uh, the annihilation cross section, the Planck mass, G star. So if you want, this is a, a, an implicit expression for TFO because there is TFO here as well, but uh, G star is a weak dependence on TFO and you even have the square root. So the consistency condition is that of course, the, if you have a model and you have a dark matter particle with a given mass and a given freeze out temperature, then you see that the freeze out temperature must be much larger than the mass to make sure that this expression you use is self-consistent. You use the relativistic expression for a number density. So you see that we have hot relics if the mass is small and or the cross section is small because you want this number to be large. So if sigma b is small, then TFO is large and it will be larger than the mass. So hot relics are light particles with small mass and with uh, small annihilation cross section. So we will see in a second that neutrinos are uh, hot relics. So after interaction stop being effective, which means that temperatures below the freeze out, then the co-moving number density is constant and it will be constant until today. So T0 is the temperature of the universe today. It's the present time. So you can find uh, this equation that I invite you to check, to check the pre-factor. And you see that the result in moving density, so this is evaluated at the freeze out, but it's also evaluated today, of course, because there is no change, is given by this expression. And there is a very tiny dependence on the freeze out temperature through this G star factor. So you see that the moving abundance you get, it's a number that you basically know, uh, there is this uh, pre-factor in terms of the effective degrees of freedom of the dark matter particle. But in the end, uh, the dependence on the freeze out temperature is very weak. And then you can convert, of course, the moving number density into a mass density today. So the rho of a hot relic is given by this expression here, where you multiply by the mass, and then you multiply the moving number density at the freeze out, which is the same as the one today, you multiply it by the entropy density today, because you want n. You want n today. 
So I also invite you to check uh, the numerics of this conversion and you have that omega h squared, the number that we want to be 0 0.12, you see that it is equal to this expression here. So there is a, an interesting bound on the mass. So this is a, a first possible answer to the question I just got. Uh, there is an upper bound on the mass of hot relics and this bound is obtained by imposing that the omega h square is less than 0 0.12, where 0 0.12 is the number we measure. So for sure, we cannot have more than what we observe. Okay, neutrinos are a subdominant component, so it's fine if, if omega h square is less than 0 0.12. If it's more, we have a problem because we predict more than what we actually see. So historically, this bound is known as the cosley mckellen bound for hot relics. And now let's discuss an important effect of uh, hot relics, which is the effect of free streaming. So these particles uh, decouple when they are relativistic. So what happens is that after decoupling, they are free. They do not interact with anything anymore. And they can free stream from over dense region to under dense region. And this uh, will erase density perturbations. We saw yesterday that there are primordial density fluctuations that collapse under gravity. And we believe they were created by inflation, okay? But uh, this is an effect that is dangerous because it erases the perturbation and in the end we cannot form structures anymore. So this um, effect of restreaming is efficient until matter radiation equality, because uh, remember, this is an equation I gave you yesterday from the first lecture. The density perturbation grow not too fast, just with the log of the scale factor during radiation domination. When you have matter domination, they grow as the scale factor itself. So you see that until matter radiation equality, this free streaming effect can compete with the gravitational collapse. Afterwards, it's uh, not efficient anymore. This is a rough estimate. You can do things more precisely, but for the purpose of a lecture, this is a nice way to illustrate the issue. So you can uh, compute, and I invite you to do this calculation, and I put in the problem one of this uh, second problem set, a guided calculation. So I guide you through the intermediate steps. And uh, you can show that you can compute the free streaming scale as a function of the matter radiation equality temperature and the time and the temperature when this particle becomes non relativistic, the particle X. Uh, sorry, X here uh, is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is chi, it's the same. And uh, you can also uh, check the mass scale that you're going to wash by this effect. So this is a result, which is the last point of problem one that you can derive. And you see that if the particle is lighter than one kV, you wash out structures above the mass of the galactic halo. The mass of the galactic halo is 10 to 11, 10 to 12 solar masses. But we know that galactic halo exists because of the galaxy, galactic rotation core that we discussed yesterday. So if the mass of the hot relic is below the KV scale, then we are going to wash perturbations on a scale larger than the one we observe today. We know that there are halos. So this is excluded by structure formation. And so hot relics cannot have mass less than one KV. So I encourage you to do problem one. It's a very instructive calculation and uh, you can have me ask me questions uh, if you have any after you try to solve the problem. So you see that hot relics lighter than the KV erase density perturbation on scales greater than galactic halos. So they are excluded. So we can conclude this uh, part on the hot relics by saying that we now see why standard model neutrinos are not viable dark matter candidates. Historically, they were viable. People thought they could be dark matter because if you think about that, they are neutral, they are stable, they are long-lived, they have, they have a mass. Well, we will learn about the mass later, but at that point, it was not excluded. So why not? Well, the reason is uh, that uh, they do not work for several reasons by now. Uh, we know that we have uh, bounds from terrestrial and cosmological bounds, which is actually cosmological bounds comes from also from the, the, st the structures. But uh, in the end, uh, 
the best bound, at least uh, uh, terrestrial bound we have is from observing the spectra of beta decays. And we know that the neutrino mass must be roughly speaking below the electroweak, the, sorry, the electron volt scale. And so if the fermion, neutrinos are fermions, if a fermion has a mass below the electron volt, it cannot serve as a good dark matter candidate because it violates the tremaine gun bound, okay? There is also a violation of the cosy mccallum bound. This is uh, something that you can see from the explicit expression, okay? And then, uh, um, sorry, not violate. I didn't mean violation here. I mean the bound is not saturated. So uh, this uh, violation. Let me explain what I mean by violation here. Sorry, what I mean is that in order for the neutrino to be dark matter, you must saturate the cosy mccallum bound. And to saturate the cosy mccallum bound, you need a mass which is above the electron volt. So they are too light to have the right abundance. And then of course you have also too much free streaming because we saw that dark matter is uh, uh, hot relics, sorry, uh, with mass below the KV are excluded by this free streaming argument and neutrinos must have a mass much lighter than the, than the KV scale because they have to be lighter than the electron volt. So this concludes the overview on hot relics and the most interesting results perhaps after well, one general result is that hot relics cannot be dark matter because of this uh, free streaming bound, okay? So, um, I mean, hot relics uh, below the KV. But in particular, we learned that uh, standard model neutrinos cannot be a viable dark matter candidate because they uh, have uh, several problems. And uh, this is the last, uh, argument that we needed in order to convince ourselves that in order to address the nature of dark matter, the microscopic nature of dark matter, we need to go beyond the standard model. The standard model does not have enough ingredients to account for the uh, uh, evidence of dark matter. The only hope was the neutrinos. It was an option viable in the 80s, but now we have several reasons to believe that this is not the case. So Enrico, I think uh, I can uh, take a break again since uh, my next topic is uh, cold relics. And uh, if there is uh, any question. Yes, uh, yes, there are. So let me, let me read them to you. So the first one is from Dibiendu who is asking, is it possible to serve the effect of the change of the free streaming of hot relics? To see uh, of the change? Yeah, to, to observe the effect of the change of the free streaming of the hot, of the hot relics. Uh, so, in, if I understand the question correctly, you could see at small cosmological scales, the effect of this uh, free streaming. And this is something that is actually an intermediate case between hot and cold. It's called uh, warm dark matter, okay? And uh, incidentally, uh, popular uh, warm dark matter candidates are sterile neutrinos, which are uh, singlets, standard model singlets, uh, and they are partner of the active neutrinos that uh, you introduce to give mass to the neutrinos in the standard model. They have mass um, around the KV scale and uh, they have a free streaming length, which is uh, within the bound, but it can also show some effects. So there is some intermediate region known as warm dark matter region where you could see the effects of this free streaming. Okay, so next question is from Alessio, who's asking, maybe I lost something, but how are the two bounds consistent with each other? We need the mass to be larger than one keV to maintain the galactic halos, but the other bound from energy density was the mass less than 170 and 68 electron volt. Do the G so, effective NG star have so much importance numerically? No, no, no. So this is uh, precisely what uh, I said at the end of this part. So dark matter cannot be hot. Uh, because uh, if it's hot, it has to have a mass above the KV. So maybe I was not clear about this. Uh, let me repeat that again. This is an important part. 
So if uh, dark matter is uh, hot, from the free streaming argument, you need a mass above the KV. And then you do the relic density calculation and you see that you make too much dark matter, precisely because you violate this bound on the mass. So the answer is that dark matter must be cold. And that's the topic that we'll address next. Okay, so Ganesh is asking, is it possible to detect the presence of dark matter uh, in the early universe from the cosmic micro microwave background radiation today? Yes, yeah, so we see the effect of dark matter because as I was discussing yesterday and uh, I was also asked one question of uh, the details, but it's, uh, it's something a bit long to explain. But basically by studying the spectrum of CMB fluctuation, we are sensitive to the total amount of neurorelativistic matter, total amount of neurorelativistic matter and amount of baryonic matter. By baryonic matter, I mean matter coupled to the photon plasma producing these uh, sound waves that I was mentioning yesterday. So we see that the amount of total matter is uh, much larger by a factor of six than the amount of baryonic matter, which means that 85% of the matter in the universe must be dark and must have been around already at the time of CMB formation. Okay, very good. So we have one more question from Sudipta. So Sudipta is asking, if the dark sector contains more than one dark matter, uh, oh, sorry, let me read it again. If the dark sector contains more than one dark matter, like if the dark sector consists of hot dark matter and cold dark matter, then what will be the bounds? Uh, so in this, these are cases that have been studied. So if you have a multi-component, one hot and one cold, uh, in this case, uh, you have, of course, that most of the dark matter must be cold and you have a bound on the amount of the hot dark matter, which is again coming from this free streaming uh, uh, argument. But of course, the bound is uh, reduced. And if I remember the numbers correctly, I may not remember well, but uh, uh, if um, the amount of uh, hot dark matter is more or less 1%, then you're fine but something okay. like that. Now I don't know the precise number, but uh, you need that most of the dark matter is cold anyway. If you have some hot component, it must be very subdominant. And by the way, this is the case of uh, the standard model because neutrinos are a subdominant. So actually in our universe, we have that most of the dark matter is cold. There is a hot component, which is the component by neutrinos. So we already know that this case is realized in nature, but we do the calculation with the bound of neutrino mass and we find that this is a very subdominant component. So we are fine. Okay, Tessio is, uh, is asking, um, the erasing of density perturbations depends on how the dark matter interacts with other particles. No, no, so this is called free streaming. And so the, at that point, uh, this is something that happens after freeze out. So free stream here, really, it really means free stream. They just propagate along geodesics and uh, they do not interact with anything. So they just move away from over dense region and they go to under dense region and they redistribute equally and evenly matter in the, in the universe. Okay, one more question from Gustavo. So this whole discussion assumes that neutrinos decouple instantaneously. The corrections due to a, delay, to a delayed decoupling change in any way the discussion? Uh, yeah, so this is true that I've been assuming that uh, the decoupling is instantaneous. Uh, you can do things more precisely and it's a very, very small correction. So nothing will change in the conclusions. Okay, so uh, I think I will take two more questions, then we move on to cold relics. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, I, I, I think I can cover the cold relics part. Otherwise, we have tomorrow too. So okay, so the, the first one is from Yoksara, who, who's asking, so the right-handed neutrino would be a possible candidate for dark matter in relation to the hot relics? Mm, not quite. I would say more in the warm region or cold, because this... Uh, um, right-handed neutrinos are, uh, are uh, more massive than uh, the active neutrinos or standard model neutrinos. They are called usually active neutrinos because they carry gauge interactions. So these are not hot relics. These are warm or cold relics. Okay, so last question from Dibiendu. As you said, neutrinos are hot relics. 
Now, from when you will start to stream, to stream freely, that depends on what kind of interactions it has. If we introduce new interactions, then can we change the temperature from which it will start to stream freely? Can we observe that effect? So, um, the temperature when they start to free stream is the freeze out temperature. And uh, you can see from this equation here, which is the problem one in the problem set, that there is actually no freeze out temperature here. It's uh, only the temperature when they become non relativistic. And this is more or less equal to their mass. So the effect is uh, dominated at uh, later times. So it's not really important when they decouple. But uh, I invite you to do this calculation and see that uh, and derive this result here, where basically there is no uh, dependence on the freeze out temperature. OK, very good. So we'll keep uh, the last question for. Uh, yeah, the so it's, uh, I think I can do the cold relics uh, in more or less uh, 20 minutes. And so we will have five more minutes to have questions in the end. Yeah, okay. and there is also the question and answer session today. So. OK, we, oh, yeah. We'll tonight, make yes. it. Uh, yes. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. OK. OK, so let's continue with cold relics. Uh, and uh, I want to focus on uh, uh, WIMPs. WIMPS is an acronym that stands for Weakly Interacting Massive Particles. And the reason why I want to focus on that is not to convince you that these are the best dark matter candidates. I don't want you to convince that dark matter is made of WIMPs, especially now after many, many years that we have been searching for them without finding them. Uh, but this is the first example of a dark matter candidate I show you in this set of lectures that actually could work. Okay, because so far we've been just discussing hot dark matter. We saw that neutrinos do not work, but in general, hot dark matter does not work as we just discussed. So this is the first example of one candidate that could work. Again, I don't want you to convince that this is the best candidate, but it is historically very important because uh, it's uh, strongly motivated from the top down. And uh, it is motivated because uh, in several extensions of the standard model addressing the hierarchy problem. And the hierarchy problem is basically, uh, it boils down to our uh, lack of understanding of why weak interactions and gravitational interactions have a strength which is so different from each other, okay? So this is something that I do not know if you discuss about uh, uh, in the previous week, but in general, uh, maybe lectures by Professor Chaco will, uh, will mention uh, extension of the standard model addressing the gauge hierarchy problem. But uh, in several of these extensions, the most famous one is probably supersymmetry. There are particles that have a mass in this range here, which is really a loose range. I don't want to mean this as a strong upper bound and this one, it's just to give an idea. So particles with these, uh, uh, mass uh, and uh, the annihilation cross-section to standard model final state of approximately one picobarn. One picobarn is the typical size of the process mediated by weak interactions. So that's why they are uh, called WIMPs. Historically, the W really meant uh, charge under SU2, the gauge group of the standard model. Now it's a bit uh, uh, less uh, rigid uh, classification. It just means that you have an annihilation cross-section of this size. So it's important to talk about these candidates, I believe, because of their historical importance, because of the, their motivation from the top down, and also because the uh, research uh, program from the experimental point of view is a very mature program. And uh, we've been searching for WIMPs uh, since uh, the 80s, and uh, we have uh, several ways to do so. And I will discuss about WIMP searches in, uh, tomorrow and on uh, Thursday as well. And so since this is an introductory course, I want to give you uh, an idea about uh, what uh, the basic strategies to search for these candidates are. And then the ideas that you use to search for these candidates, you can also recycle in, uh, for other candidates. Um, so let's begin by the definition of a cold relic. So they decouple when they are non relativistic. So remember that in the ray there is this uh, sigma v expansion. So you can do a partial wave expansion. 
And uh, in the second problem that I posted for this lecture, I give you two explicit examples where in one case, the cross-section is S wave, in the other case is a P wave. So this is S, P, D, all the partial waves. And uh, I gave you the Lagrangian to do the cross-section calculation. And I also gave you the answer for the coefficients A and B in the two cases. So you can check that actually there are cases where you can uh, find a constant term in the non-relativistic expansion or your expansion may not have a constant term and start with the B-square dependence, okay? So let's do the freeze-out calculation again. And this freeze-out calculation is quite standard and it's uh, basically identical to the previous one. The only thing that changes is that now for the equilibrium number density, I put the non-relativistic expression, okay? So there is a, a more standard way to write down this equation by introducing this variable x. x f o is defined as m chi divided t f o. So by consistency with the uh, assumption that the relic is cold, then this x f o must be a number bigger than one because we want t f o to be less than the mass of chi. So what you can do uh, is you plug uh, numbers for the masses and for the cross sections. This G is uh, just a number of order one and you can solve this equation numerically or through iterations if you want. But you see, you cannot find an analytical equation because you have uh, the XFO appearing in the exponential and also in the power here. So you need, um, you need to do a numerical calculation, but uh, I invite you to check again this number that if you put for the wind mass, uh, the typical mass that I gave you before, and also for the cross section, the pico barn, and be careful when you do the pico barn, you have to convert one pico barn in GV to the minus two, because uh, uh, we are using a natural unit system where cross sections have units of energy to the minus two. So you see that you have plus one, plus one, minus two. This combination is dimensionless. And then everything is dimensionless here. The left hand side is of course dimensionless. So this equation makes sense, at least from the unit's point of view. So if you put the numbers, you see that X F O must be between 20 and 25. So this is a good consistency check because as I mentioned, we wanted X F O to be bigger than one to be consistent with the fact that freeze out of uh, cold relics happens when these relics are not relativistic. So let me give you a picture of uh, the production of cold relics with this figure here and describe to you what happens. Then uh, there is not much we have left to do for today. I, give, I will give you this description. Then I will give you an equation for the mass density. And then tomorrow we will introduce the Boltzmann equation, which is uh, a much, uh, uh, I would say, detailed way to keep track of the number density. Okay, so let's start slowly. Uh, wind genesis takes place when the universe is dominated by radiation bath. Okay, so this is something I said already at the beginning of this lecture. But uh, remember, this is an assumption. Okay, this is an assumption. So here I put in this box one commoving volume. Now we know what the commoving volume is. Commoving volume is a volume that stays constant as the universe expands. Okay, so imagine that this volume gets bigger proportionally to the Hubble expansion. So let's start from describing this uh, thermal bath. So this thermal bath, it is definitely filled by standard model particles. Okay, here again, I put uh, the known example of standard model particles. Given, uh, give, uh, if, you, if you take a given standard model extension, you are likely to fill the primordial bath with something else. And every theorist has its favorite extension. You can imagine that the primordial bath is filled by these beautiful creatures that I love very much. And uh, you can think about anything else, but as long as you keep track of the fact that when you change the content of the primordial bath, you just need the change in G star, okay? So I will keep the discussion generic and I will denote with the blue, the bath particles. And with this, uh, I guess, uh, brown color, the dark matter particles X, okay? 
So here is a description of the commoving volume when the dark matter mass is much less than the temperature. So dark matter particles are relativistic. So everything is in equilibrium. So the commoving volume will look like this. Of course, maybe there will be more bad particles because of the G star multiplicity, but just to give you one idea, they are all proportional to T cube, the number density. So you have lots of X particles when you are in this range of temperature, okay? So this is the starting point. And by the way, the fact that you are in equilibrium, it erases the memory of anything that happened before. If you are in equilibrium, you are in equilibrium. You don't care what happened before, okay? Very good. So now we follow the arrow of time. So the temperature will get smaller. And you will get at some point when the temperature hits the dark matter mass. And so you start to feel the Maxwell Boltzmann suppression. The Maxwell Boltzmann suppression tells you that this particle X will, be, will start becoming less abundant. You see that they are disappearing. Nothing will change in the commuting volume for the bad particles because in the commuting volume, the uh, number density of bad particles is constant. They are relativistic, okay? So the commuting density is not changing. And then you will reach a point when the temperature is the dark matter mass over 25. And these dark matter particles now decouple from the plasma. So you see you have much even less because now you're deeper in the Maxwell Boltzmann tail when the dark matter mass is, uh, I mean, the relation between temperature and mass is given by this uh, ratio here, 25 that I mentioned before. And then basically this, uh, uh, this picture of the commoving volume is preserved until today. So the dark matter particle the, the commuting density remains constant at T much less than the dark matter particle over 25. And in particular, it will be much less, it will be given by this uh, value today, okay? So this is the qualitative picture. We will be more quantitative tomorrow by uh, using the Boltzmann equation. But uh, the last thing I want to do for today is to give you one equation for omega h square of a cold relic. Omega h square in the same way I gave you for the hot relics. And uh, the reason why I want to give you this is to show you how it depends on the particle mass, how it depends on the particle cross section, and uh, what are the typical values that you need in order to reproduce the, 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 the value that you observe. So the calculation is uh, identical to the one of uh, the previous case. There is a mistake that all my students do at the exam. So I'm telling you this mistake. So you will not make this mistake if you ever take one exam. So when you compute the commuting number density, it's n chi over s at the freeze out. You have two options. Either you put inside the expression of n chi, the Maxwell Boltzmann with the power law, the exponent, the exponent you put the explicit expression for TFO, and then you get lost in calculations or you use the freeze out condition, which is absolutely doing the same, okay? It's, it's really the same, but uh, you don't need to go through the exponential again. Of course, these two things are the same, but if you know that the freeze out condition is n sigma v equal to h, the way to derive n is h divided by sigma v. Very simple. And then you, know the expression for the entropy density, you know the expression for Hubble, you do everything. This is the expression you get for Y. And you see that Y goes, I mean, it's proportional to this X, which is uh, a number of order 20, 25. And then it goes like the inverse mass and the inverse cross section, which means the inverse mass in particular means that once, once we take omega H square, so we compute the mass density, then uh, you see that uh, there is no mass dependence in this final equation because we are multiplying this by n. Okay, so here I put all the steps that I invite you to check, of course. But uh, this expression, the first one in this box is very uh, useful and important because it tells you that the relic density of cold relics, it depends on uh, the mass of the dark matter particle very weakly because the only place where the mass appears is in this uh, TFO and XFO. Okay, so the G star, these, these are factors that do not change very much. The XFO depends on the particle mass, of course, but it depends only logarithmically, as we saw when we computed that. The dependence on the cross-section is much, much stronger. 
because it goes like one over sigma. So if you take a particle with the cross section, which is 10 times larger than a value you were considering before, the resulting relative density will be 10 times smaller than the number you were considering before. So there is a strong dependence. And uh, this is actually, uh, this makes sense physically. And uh, I will explain the reason why you have this one over sigma dependence tomorrow. We will solve the Boltzmann equation. I will show you plots of uh, how Y depends on the temperature, and we will discuss why there is this behavior. Okay. For now, let's leave it like that, and tomorrow we will discuss this uh, peculiar dependence in great detail. So I want to conclude this lecture with uh, with an explanation of a miracle, which of course is not a miracle. It's uh, just a famous uh, known fact. And uh, first of all, uh, you can uh, show that this expression here for the omega h square can be rewritten by uh, converting everything in the right unit and by putting the explicit expression for M Planck. So the G star factor is of course expected to be around this value, but there is a weak dependence on G star. So you see that basically the uh, annihilation cross section that you need to reproduce the relic density is the peak of barn. So this is something that I anticipated, but now from this expression, it's a manifest that one pico bar is what you need. By the way, you remember when I gave you this range, uh, there was a range for the mass, but there was not much freedom for the cross section. Okay, that's the reason because the relic density has a weak dependence on the mass. So we can live with the weight mass in a wide range. But once we have to specify the cross section, we cannot be too far away from this pico bar value. Okay. So this is an interesting number because it's uh, a weak scale cross section. And uh, here I put uh, an explicit expression for sigma v, where you estimate as a coupling square divided by a mass square. And you see that if you put a weak coupling, it's a coupling of the size of the weak coupling and a mass of the order of weak scale, you get one picobar. From this expression, you need to uh, see that in order to have one picobar, you do not need new physics at the weak scale. The reason why this was called the wind miracle is that it was expected, the, the expectation of having new physics at the weak scale was beyond the dark matter problem. Physicists were expecting new physics at the weak scale for other issues such as the hierarchy problem I mentioned before. So the presence of these new degrees of freedom at that scale was already conceived. And the fact that you can kill two birds with one stone, in some sense you are solving two problems with just one solution, is known as the wind miracle. Of course, I don't see this is a miracle because thermal freeze out and the freeze out of cold relics does not work only for processes mediated by weak interaction. All you need is this number for the cross section, pico bar, but you can get one pico bar even if you have something much lighter than the weak scale. You just have to take a smaller coupling and make sure that the ratio alpha over m stays constant. So you can get the thermal freeze out of cold relics with the right abundance, even without anything new at the weak scale. And for example, you can get all the way, you can go all the way down to GV or even slightly above the MEV. All you need is a small coupling alpha. So I conclude by saying that this is not a miracle. Of course, uh, I didn't even need to say that, but just to be clear. And uh, I also invite you to derive this uh, equation, this uh, form of uh, the omega h square number. This is something that you can do by starting from uh, this expression here. So this is the most general one, okay? But then uh, you can show that this is actually the case up to order one factors, okay? Uh, this doesn't mean to be rigorous. This is the temperature of matter radiation equality, okay? More or less one EV, okay? So the wind miracle is just a remarkable numerical coincidence. And it tells you that if you take 
if you plug this uh, value for the cross section here and you take a coupling which is more or less of the weak scale size then the weak scale this 200 gb is equal to the geometric mean of the Planck mass and the equilibrium temperature two numbers very different from each other this is 10 to the 18 gb this is one ev but the geometric mean gives you the weak scale so Enrico, I will stop here and tomorrow we will rederive these results with the Boltzmann equation. So we will do a much more careful analysis and then we will start to discuss experiments because so far we've been only living in the early universe, but uh, we also want to discover these particles today. So I will take questions now. Okay, very good. So there are uh, quite a few questions. So let me go, let me put some order. Okay, so the first question is from Jenny. So the question is, are hot relics related to the latest times in the universe? Uh, not necessarily because, uh, for example, neutrinos uh, decouple when the temperature is one MeV. This is something you should have seen in the first week. So the density of this relic was set when the universe was uh, one second old. Remember one MeV is one second. So one second, I would not call it the latest time. It's actually quite, uh, the universe was quite, quite, was quite young. Next question is from Lorenzo, who's asking, why did the dark matter particles decrease in the thermal bath? In the figure I was showing. I think so. Yes, so this is uh, the picture of one co-moving volume, okay? So the number density inside the commoving volume is uh, constant because uh, it's basically the Y variable. So you have that the number density goes like T cube, but the entropy density also goes like T cube, so it's constant. This is true as long as particles are relativistic. So these B particles in the plasma are always relativistic by assumption. We take the universe dominated by a hot gas of radiation of course, one of these could be the top quark and then it goes non relativistic, but the majority are relativistic. So I started to decrease them. You see, when the temperature became of the order of the dark matter mass, then they were even less when the temperature were dark matter mass over 25. So what's going on here is just the Maxwell Boltzmann suppression. We are considering temperatures below the mass, and so you pay a price which is the Maxwell Boltzmann suppression. That's the, the only reason why they were decreasing. Okay, so next question is from Sudipta. So the question is, is there any lower bound for WIMP masses? And if yes, uh, where does it come from? So I will discuss bounds on the mass tomorrow, but I can anticipate that uh, a lower bound uh, is uh, one MeV. And uh, the reason is uh, that if you have uh, some relic that is in equilibrium with mass below one MeV, then it will be in equilibrium as a relativistic degrees of freedom at the time of Big Bang nucleosynthesis. And then you would see, it would play the role of an additional neutrinos. Okay, so you would mess up the predictions of light elements. So to stay safe, a thermal relic must be heavier than one MeV. And it comes from BBN. Very good. So next question is from Ankit. The question is, if the dark matter abundance remains constant after the freeze out, wouldn't the dark matter annihilation today change its abundance? Sorry, uh, annihilation today? Yeah. So there are annihilations that happen out of equilibrium, so after freeze out, but these are really, really rare events and they will not impact the overall abundance. So it is, uh, so tomorrow we will be actually more careful and we will solve the Boltzmann equation because today the freeze out was like an instantaneous process until sometime they were in equilibrium and then suddenly they decoupled completely. Tomorrow we will solve this equation that we will show uh, that this is actually an event that takes some time uh, interval, but uh, it's quite sharp as an event. So the annihilation happening after freeze out are extremely rare and will not change the abundance. Okay, so next question is from Anupan. So the question is, are we putting by hand the thermally average cross-section for WIMPs to be one picobarn? So by hand, uh, 
let's see. Uh, I mean, if you want, to, you can take the opposite view and say, I do the value density calculation for a generic thermal relic, and I find this equation. So I learned that if I want to reproduce the abundance, I need a cross section of one pico bar. Okay. So this equation is valid all the time. But if we want to reproduce the abundance, there it must be one pico bar. Now, as I say, there are several standard model extensions where this number, one pico bar, comes naturally because these are uh, new degrees of freedom at the electrobic scale. And so you're not really putting that by end. This is the in some sense that we miracle. You expect these particles to be around for other reasons. You expect this cross section to be one pico bar, and it's remarkable that this is the number you need for the relic density. Very good. So one more question from Jenny. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the question is, I did not understand well why in WIMP Genesis, the temperature is divided by 25. Okay, so the way to derive the 25, and I invite you to do that, so you can take this equation for the freeze out temperature, okay? And uh, if you solve this equation, so x is the unknown variable, you need to solve for x. And uh, if you solve for x, uh, you see, and you plug for the cross section one pico bar, and you have to be careful about the units here, because you see, this is something that you express in GV. This is also in GV. So you have to convert one pico bar in one over GV square. This combination must be dimensionless, okay? If you plug the numbers for masses and cross sections in the WIMP window, then you see the typical values of XFO are between 20 and 25. So when I did this uh, uh, illustration here, I say the dark matter mass over 25 as the typical temperature of freeze out but this typical temperature of freeze out arises from this calculation here. Okay, so one more question from Miguel. Which are the degrees of freedom of the dark matter? I mean, which is the spin of the dark matter? So this is a parameter of the model, exactly as the mass is a parameter and the sigma and the cross section is a parameter. You can have scalar dark matter, fermion dark matter, vector dark matter, even spin three half dark matter. There are several examples. And uh, for the freeze out calculation, they only enter in this, uh, in this uh, three factor here, G chi, the number of internal degrees of freedom. But uh, it's fair to say that we don't know the spin of dark matter and uh, all the options at the moment are, are allowed as long as you respect the bounds I discussed yesterday for bosons and fermions, but otherwise, uh, this is something we don't know. Okay, so I see that Sudipta is raising his hand. So Sudipta, if you have a question, please come forward. Hello. Hello. Hi. Yes, go ahead, please. Yeah. Hi, sir. So I am talking about I mean, the, for WIMP kind of particle, there is an upper bound coming from unitarity. So uh, by using the unitarity, you can also put bound on the uh, radius of that WIMP. So this model independent bound of uh, on the radius of the WIMP is around uh, 7.5 into 10 to the power minus 7 Fermi meter, uh, femtometer, sorry. So is the WIMP particle is the fundamental particle or we can have some structure uh, by looking at this bound on the radius of the WIMP kind so of- So the, the unitarity bound is uh, something that I will discuss tomorrow. Okay, so- uh... I, I will discuss this bound. I said I, I, I said that uh, I will uh, discuss uh, upper and lower bounds on the mass uh, tomorrow when we do a more careful analysis. Well, let me just say that an, an argument for unitarity allows us to put an upper bound on the uh, dark matter mass, which is around 100 TeV. And uh, there is really no problem with having a fundamental particle with that mass. It could be a fundamental particle. There is no reason why the, the, the he has to be composite. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Okay, very good. So there are a couple more questions, but since we are already- Yeah, we you already decide. Uh, time, I think it's better if we keep the additional questions for the Q&A so that we can- That's have fine, a smooth okay. Transition. You are the Okay, very good. So 
I think uh, this is a good moment to take 15 minutes uh, of break uh, before uh, Masha's lecture. So, Francesco, thank you very much for the very nice lecture. And You're welcome. Uh, we'll see you this afternoon, uh, Brazilian time, uh, for the Q&A session. Okay. See you later. Okay. Thank you. Bye -bye. See you later. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs>